everyone, and welcome to the 36th episode of the Startup Boston podcast, where I interview entrepreneurs, investors, and influencers in the Boston startup community to uncover actionable advice and stories from their experiences. I'm your host, Nick Dupuy. Today's guest is Andy Ori. Andy sold his last company, Acme Packet, to Oracle for $2.1 billion. Soon afterwards, co-founded his current company, 128 Technology. 128 Technology is on a mission to fix the internet. The internet is broken, and 128 is here to solve the problem. The current demands on the internet are not what it was originally designed for, yet there hasn't been any major advances in networking technology in over 20 years. Enter 128 Technology, which can provide greater network security delivered with a much simpler experience for a fraction of the cost. In this episode, Andy talks about why the internet is broken and how it got that way, what he was able to take away from Acme Packet and apply to 128 Technology, how their secure vector routing and zero trust security is disrupting the market, and how he sees the internet continuing to evolve. If you like today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you can get all of the new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And as always, you can find today's show notes at startupbostonpodcast.com. Enjoy today's episode. Andy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. (laughs) Nick, thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Thank you for having me here. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure, sure. I was born in Massachusetts, born in Worcester. I've lived uh, in Massachusetts my whole life. For the last 27 years, I've been involved in uh, starting, building, and running uh, enterprises, mostly, if not all, technology companies in the Commonwealth. I like to play guitar and poker and drink wine, and I don't know what else to say. (laughs) Tell me about uh, Acme Packet. Let's start there. Sure. That was really a great business. We, we started the business in uh, August 3rd of 2000, and uh, the business was an independent business for 51 quarters. Its mission really was to allow for a secure, high-quality voice and video over IP across and between all of these IP networks. In 2000, when we started, the cost of telephone calls was almost zero. And so the notion that telephone calls and ultimately video as well, would move on to IP networks, people thought was a dumb idea. And generally, when people think something's a dumb idea, there's, there's, there's something there there. You should mm-hmm. focus on it. And so we said, hmm, we think it's going to happen for other reasons. And so we got a whiteboard. I have a house that's uh, located just on Route 128. And we started inviting friends to come in. And we said, show us how you would make a VoIP call work. And everyone could show us a little bit, but they basically connected lines to clouds. And we said, no, no, that's not how it works. You have to actually show us how the packets walk across and between these networks, and no one could. And when we, when we saw no one could, we said, wow, maybe we want to try and figure that out. And we did. And we discovered that to make secure, high-quality voice and video over IP, particularly interactive communications, work, it required a brand-new element in the network at the edges called a session border controller. And uh, we invented the term, we developed the product. It did require that they exist at all the network edges, which uh, in the early days of our business, the venture capitalists felt that that was kind of a problem with the business model. And we said, that's true, that is a problem. However, it's going to happen, and this is the only way it can work. And subsequently, it did happen. And yes, there are session border controllers at the edge of all of these networks. And uh, we were able to transit, terminate, originate large plurality of the world's IP traffic for voice and video. What did you find was the key driver for growing the company? You know, finding a real problem. You know, so many businesses I look at are businesses where they're incrementally advancing a position. They're making something somebody's already doing a little bit better. When something's really broken, that's what people need to fix. So you had to find a problem that really was broken. And in this case, all of the carriers globally knew that they were operating a voice network for their, for their voice and a data network, an IP network for their data, and it was just too darn expensive. And they wanted to operate one network, and they knew IP wasn't going away. And so they said, well, we're going to get rid of our voice network, so we're going to have to have voice run on their IP network. And that's what they mandated, their strategic plans. And every time they tried to do that, they found they could not connect their network with someone else's network securely. They found they couldn't protect their infrastructure from denial of service attacks. They found that they couldn't transit the firewalls. They found these issues that really were were gating items. And so we would go into the service providers and would say, we can solve your gating items for what you're trying to do strategically. And that's the only reason they would talk to us. Anything short of that, anything short of that, Mark, and you're just going to find a lot of people who say, wow, that's a really good idea. I'll call you back next year. Is there anything that you would have done differently if you could do it all over again? 
You know, we often sit down. My my uh, partner and co-founder at Acme Packet is my partner here and my co-founder. We have uh, four other, five other co-founders here. There's seven of us. And so we do have um, a common context in which we look at the last 15 or 16 years and say, what could we have done differently? The truth is, I don't think we could have created any more value or participated to a greater extent in the market than we did. I think the real limiting factor was the market that we selected. We, we had 60% of the market globally, and the market ended up only growing at about 10% a year after it initially expanded and we expanded into that market. I think that market selection is the single most important aspect that results in long-term enterprise value opportunity and value creation. So the only thing I could have done differently is to select a better market opportunity. But one didn't present itself, nor was I probably capable of identifying one at that time. So I'm actually a pretty satisfied person through that experience. I think we did the best we possibly could. After being acquired, was it your goal to start another company? And how did you eventually land on the idea to start 128 technology. So so we started in August of 2000, and then the market fell apart in 2001. And by 2003, one of our venture capitalists took us off their website. We weren't even worthy of being on their website. I mean, it was, it was crazy times. The customers we would go see were all laying people off. We would walk into these service providers, and they would have cube farms. Their floors, whole floors were empty. It was just a really tough time. And we ended up going public in 2006. And I think we were the first technology company in Massachusetts in a six-year period to actually have an IPO. And I thought that we were likely going to be acquired within a year or two because, I don't know, that's what I always was taught. If you, if you don't get acquired before you go public, you go public and maybe someone buys you. I ended up running the company as the CEO um, as a public company for 26 quarters. I mean, we, we really ran and grew a business. And so by the time I was done, after 51 quarters, all I really wanted to do was go home and spend six months doing nothing. That's what I wanted to do, just nothing. It had been 24 years. I wanted a rest. And so the third day, I'm, I'm lying around the house, and my wife comes in, and she says, so what are you doing today? I said, I'm not doing anything. She said, you're not doing anything. I said, no. She said, well, I didn't sell my business. I need help with this and this and this. We've got kids and all this other <laughs> stuff. And bless her soul, she works really hard. And she was not out of a job. I was out of a job. And so she put me to work. <laughs> and it was, it was really wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I found out it was a lot of hard work. And I also really missed being involved in ideating, you know, putting teams together, talking about culture and trying to solve problems. And so after about six months, my, uh, my juices started flowing again, and you know these guys approached me at some point after that, and they said they had a really good idea and they needed a CEO. I'm always suspect when someone tells me they need a CEO, because you don't really need a CEO. What you need is you need a good product, a good market, and some resources, and go out and sell. But these were my guys that I worked with in the past, and I think they enjoyed working with me, and they felt that uh, tying the vision together, uh, creating the management team, raising the capital, those kinds of things um, would be helpful. And so I was delighted, and uh, we started this business on uh, July 7th, uh, 2014. So I want to move into talking about 128 technology. Sure. But first, tell us a little bit about what are some of the current challenges that we face today with the Internet. Oh, my God, the Internet's broken. It's just, it's, it's a complete mess. So if you look out these windows, you see $400 billion of infrastructure. This runs the world. That infrastructure comes in three flavors, storage, compute, and network. And what's interesting is that two of those three have been so disrupted, they don't even look like they did 10 years ago. Storage, EMC is out of business. I mean, you can almost see where they would be from out this window, and they don't exist anymore. The computer you're using isn't going to come with a hard drive anymore. Net storage has been forever disrupted, technologically, business model. And then when you look at compute, Everyone runs virtualized machines. They run multiple applications per core. We have completely different business models underlying that technology. And so you've seen a tremendous disruption in terms of compute. Network hasn't changed in 25 years, literally frozen in time. You could take a router from 25 years ago. No kidding. You could dust that thing off. Its speeds and feeds would be very slow. But other than that, you plug that router from 1996 mm -hmm. in, it's going to come up and it's going to start running. And the problem is, is that what the network was designed to do is not the way the network's being used today. The network was designed to interconnect 
computers and, and other computer networks so that we could consume packets of data. There's nobody that's on this podcast that consumes packets of data. Every single listener, you and me included, we consume services and applications. Services and applications have session state. Routing is session stateless. And so what we've had over 25 years is a series of incremental technology add-ons that have solved one minor problem after another. And so we didn't have security. There was no security in networking. So somebody said, we need a firewall. There was no notion of dealing with a server getting overwhelmed. And so somebody said, well, we need a load balancer. And then people couldn't figure out what was actually happening on their networks as they started to scale and they were monetizing the traffic. So they came up with deep packet inspection. Even a company like Acme Packet, we couldn't transit voice and video over IP that was interactive in nature across and between these networks. So we invented a session border controller. And then we have folks who work at home and they need to have secure access to, to their enterprise infrastructure so they have VPNs. And almost every enterprise that's participating in our economy today of any size uses special engineered pipes called MPLS pipes. So all of these augmentations are session stateful augmentations. It's so complicated now that we can't even run our network securely. It's not that people don't care, and it's not that people are dumb. It's that people don't understand because on the surface, these networks are complicated. Complexity means lack of security. It means lack of agility. It takes forever to bring new services. So you have companies that are traditional brick and mortar companies that are looking at their digital upstarts that they're competing with saying, oh my god, how do I compete with them? My, my infrastructure tells me it takes nine months to get anything done. They're coming out with new releases every 30 days, and that's what the customers want. And so we're seeing all of this, and we said, this is the problem we need to solve. And as we dug into the problem, what we understood is that more of the same won't work anymore, that the incrementalization, one more piece of technology to solve the current problem and get us to tomorrow kicking the proverbial can down the road, doesn't work. And it doesn't work because of what's changed in the market that's different from 10 years ago. Number one, we always have had the crushing growth of bandwidth. OK, that, but that's continuing. That's just table stakes. The big one is the cloud. So so many of these companies have connection to the cloud. This business, 128 Technology, is separate and different than every other business I've ever run because my wire room closet is virtual. So for example, all of my unified communications is in the Fuse cloud. All of my um, you know, finance is in a NetSuite Oracle cloud. Uh, all of my customer relationship management is in a Salesforce cloud. The cloud isn't one giant fluffy thing that is managed in concert. The cloud is this hyper-fragmentation that's 1,000, 10,000 different privately managed networks. And so what ends up happening is that we're almost always guaranteed that where a consumer is and where the service or application resides, I've got to connect those two, are never going to be in the same network. Routing wasn't designed that way. Routing policies stop at network edges, and we live in a world that is becoming hyper-fragmented with many, many edges. And then we're all mobile. We've got mobile devices. We move between networks. The applications are mobile. Everything's going to be encrypted end-to-end. -end. It's just going to happen. So these kinds of trends mean the way we run our networks today with all these augmentative technologies to deliver services and applications, just doesn't work tomorrow. And nobody has an answer. The industry is searching for an answer. So it's been searching. Two years ago when we started, the buzzwords were SDN and NFE, Software Defined Networks and Network Function Virtualization. And they said, that's going to solve the problem. And if you ask people what SDN and NFE were, you'd get a different answer from each person. And so much was being written every single day on SDN and NFV that when we started this business, we couldn't even keep current. We couldn't read every day what was being created every day. And we, we began to find that there was this theme to SDN and NFE, and it was all about taking a really complex environment that's doing what it wasn't designed to do, and we're going to fix it by by abstracting the control from the elements because we're going to make them software and then we're going to orchestrate them in a master orchestrator and we're going to instantiate end-to-end -end services. Now, if anybody on this podcast understands what that means, they're smarter than I am because all I hear is really complex technologies and mechanisms to take what's already too complicated to make it really simple. And that doesn't seem like it's going to really scale. And so we looked at it and we said, wow, Maybe we ought to be totally different, and we're not routing guys and gals, and we don't come from the routing world. And so we said, huh, what if we could reinvent routing? 
what if we could start, take that elemental building block and make it different? What would we make different about it? And some people think, well, making it in software is different. No, it doesn't, doesn't matter whether it's hardware or software in terms of its function. But I can change it if it's software. So when we started this business, we noticed that you were able to build routers and software with no technical debt. They were as fast and they scaled as big as their purpose-built pieces of hardware. Now, what was different is that if I could make something in software, I could change its DNA. And that's what we wanted to do. We changed the DNA of routers to make them session stateful, to make routers aware that the network's job and goal and mission is to deliver applications and services to end users. And that, believe it or not, solves all these problems. We believe that we can fix the internet by fixing the interconnection of all these networks, by radically simplifying routing, and by making it session and service aware and doing away with all of those augmentative technologies. And that's really, that's really our mission, it's really our vision. If you know storage and computing, I've seen all these advances and innovations over the years. Why has networking been so stagnated? That's a great question. That, I mean, that's really a great question. We, my my uh, my partner and I argue about this from time to time. I think two things. I think number one, um, so much of it was done in hardware because the internet grew so quickly. The demands on network connections grew so rapidly that keeping up with the speeds and the feeds required purpose-built silicon. I mean, that was it. You, had, you just had to do it in hardware. The first routers, here we are in 128. And routing was invented in 128, at least IP routing, were software. But they just weren't robust enough. And as it started to grow, everything had to be in hardware. And once we got behind the power curve and could barely keep up with the generations of silicon, I think that hardware doesn't lend itself well to innovation. The second thing is you had one dominant player that had 60-plus percent of the market. The combination of those two things probably stagnated and prevented um, the innovation of routing. Who was the one player with 60%? Oh, Cisco. Cisco, Cisco was a yeah. great business that did a great job. Um, when I started, it was you never got fired if you did business with IBM. That was back in the 80s. And then as you went through the 90s into the aughts, it became you never got fired if you did business with Cisco. And what's happened this is to me is, 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 is really interesting. There is a generational shift in terms of the buyers at the largest enterprises in the world. They're increasingly becoming millennials, not baby boomers, and they consume technology very differently. They have very different expectations. They have very different risk profiles, and they have very different vendor loyalties. And they're actually saying, I don't like what I've inherited. It's inherently fragile, hard to understand, very costly, and doesn't make my customer, whether it's my boss who doesn't want any security breaches, or my CIO who wants to make sure I run it effectively, or it's my internal business customer whose demands I can't meet because I can't give them services quickly enough. Whatever it is, I don't like what I've inherited, and I don't like how it has impacted my career. I want to go see some innovative ideas. And these people are open for the first time in a generation. People are open to individuals coming in with new technology saying, I can solve your problem. And that, to me, is the state change that's going to allow real innovation and real disruption in that networking area of infrastructure. Tell me about secure vector routing and how it compares to the standard technology being used today. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So when... When the first computers were made, there were five computers, right? And IBM said, that's about all the world needs is five computers. Well, I mean, we ended up finding more uses for computers, and we, we built more computers and more computers. And I remember Cabletron got into business because everyone was selling computers, but nobody was connecting them. And so uh, Bob Levine and Craig Benson came up with the idea that they would actually cut the wire to length and connect the computers. And they built Cabletron. So people started connecting the computers. Well, when you connect the computers, you wanted to be able to talk to one another. And so the internet, networking, was born. When the, when the internet was born, every computer had a publicly routable address that could be resolved. So every computer could talk to every computer. And that was really cool. But then people started to notice, geez, I've got 15 or 20 computers in my business. And I'm really glad that they can go talk to all the other computers when they need to. But I would not like to have everyone be able to just initiate a conversation into my computers. Because people started getting hacked. No one knew what to do. And someone came up with a firewall. There was no security. Networking and security don't, there's no, it doesn't exist. And so someone put a firewall in front of those computers and created a LAN, a local area network. It didn't exist before. 
and it gave it private, non-routable IP addresses. So these computers now were, could talk to each other, but had a firewall that prevented the rest of the world from talking to them, but those computers still wanted to talk to the rest of the world. So what did that firewall do? It became stateful. It had directionality. So it said, I'll allow those 10 computers that I trust, those are trusted computers because that's my company, they can go through me out to the internet. They can go anywhere they want because God knows I don't know where they're going to go. And every month, more stuff's out there. So I can't figure it out. So I'm going to create this rule, which is you can go through me wherever you want. Now, wherever you go, if you request information coming back, and I can remember that it came from your initiation, I'll let it go through. I'll only allow responses from the untrusted world to initiations from the trusted side. And that seemed to work. That is how, that's called perimeter security, and that's how firewalls work today. Here's the problem with that. Today, not all the devices behind my firewall are trusted. You look at this iPhone right here. I bring it to work. It's a computer. It's not part, it's not corporate property. It's not trusted, nor, nor would my iPad. So in the, trusted, in the trusted world here of 128 technology, I've got untrusted devices. Then you take companies like Oracle and other corporations that have 50, 60, 80 percent of their workforce is virtual, working from Starbucks. These are trusted people on the untrusted side of my firewall. How the heck do I figure out how to create directionality where I want trusted initiation and untrusted response, but not untrusted initiation? It doesn't exist. The only way it worked was with a stateful firewall. What we did is we took what a firewall basically does, which is allowing policies to be applied so that trusted devices can initiate communications and untrusted devices can respond, but untrusted devices can't initiate communications to trusted devices, and we put that into the routing policy. We turned every route path into a firewall by making it stateful and directional, because that's how security is affected at a network level. So we're taking what didn't exist but was laid on top and is no longer effective, which is perimeter-based security and firewalls, and we're putting it into every route path. That's what a secure vector route is. A vector is directional, and security is what I talked about. So it's a directional route path. Okay. And you also have what oh, you're calling zero trust security. Yes. Correct? Well, zero trust security is being able to um, <clears throat> apply that network-wide. Okay. So we don't trust anybody, and we don't trust anywhere. We only allow policies to connect people. So on with zero trust security, I have a couple questions. So if there's no traffic or source that gets a free pass, right? How yep. does that affect performance? Well, what, what, what's amazing is even, even trusted devices we don't trust, by the way. So let's take the target breach. The target breach is a great study, case study because, first of all, the IT organization at Target is actually quite good. And, and they got hacked in a way that, frankly, many, many people have been and, and, and could be hacked. They, they had a point-of-sale terminal. And they were having problems with their HVAC, and the HVAC vendor came in, and the HVAC vendor needed an IP address so they could talk to their various HVAC computers that were controlling everything. They gave them an address. They did all the right things. They left. And the target folks forgot to revoke that IP address, that, that, that access passcode they gave the HVAC folks. The HVAC folks were hacked. Someone found the address, and they were able to get into Target. And then what they did is they inserted malware into a point-of-sale terminal. Now, if you remember what I said back originally with the advent of the firewall, since we don't know where people are going to go, we just have trusted and untrusted, and we let the trusted side go anywhere they want in the untrusted world, and our basic security is trusted can talk to untrusted, and untrusted can only respond but can't initiate. Well, that's not enough, because in a zero-trust world, you don't have a default route. Every single firewall that's out this window in corporate America has default route paths because they don't know where their trusted resources want to go. And when that point-of-sale terminal was hacked, it did what everyone said was the right thing. It would send that, the uh, credit card information to the point-of-sale terminal, but it would also surreptitiously take that information, punch a hole through the firewall, and go to Eastern Europe and deposit it onto another server. Now, why in the world would you allow your point-of-sale terminal in Minneapolis to ever go to Eastern Europe? Why? The only answer is you don't have the ability to control trusted devices with limited route paths. So in a zero-trust world, you understand who's trusted and who's untrusted, and you even police the trusted side by controlling where they actually can go. Because malware needs Internet access like a fire needs oxygen. If you can shut down un inappropriate or unwanted internet access, 
you're going to prevent an awful lot of theft and problems. Tell me about how your product is deployed and how easy it is to deploy. It, it is actually fairly easy, but a lot of the work that we're going to do over the next two years is to make it a lot easier. What we've discovered, you know, through the course of the last couple of years is that deploying anything is difficult. It takes a long time for the service providers to give you the MPLS pipes. It takes a long time for large IT organizations to be comfortable opening up holes in their firewall. Everything takes a long time. So a big part of this technology has to be to make things much, much simpler. By, by making things simpler, you make it easier to deploy. How does the cost compare to you know, the comparable technology that's pretty standard today? There are three points to this disruption. The, the first one is, fundamentally, the technology is different and better. It is, it is stateful session-oriented routing, which is very, very different than session stateless routing. It allows you to align and optimize service delivery and application delivery to your customers in a way that you can't do with stateless firewalls alone. That, that is really disruptive, and the world is going to understand that. It's not just going to come from us. I mean, there's $400 billion of infrastructure out there. We're committed to being open and standards-based, and we want other people saying the same thing. It's just going to happen. In 60 months, many, many of your listeners' network edges are going to have smart, stateful, session-oriented routing. I hope it all comes from 128 technology, but it all won't. So that's one area. The, the second disruption is the price. It's way too expensive. It's way too expensive because of the way it's architected. Who ever heard of a marketplace where you drive, you drive to Market Basket, you get four quarts of milk, you go home in your driveway, you pour three of them out in the driveway, and you only take one into your refrigerator? That's crazy. That's networking. Most of the internet is under provision. It's under provision because people don't understand, can't control, and can't manage their connectivity. They can't do it because it's not session-oriented. And when it's session-oriented, it becomes predictive. It becomes deterministic. I can start to run things to a much greater capacity. And then there's just the notion of I'm paying for things I'm not using. Let's imagine out this window is another one of our locations. And you and I are the two, uh, we're the two IT managers, and we decided to go get a drink and talk about in connectivity between our two locations. And we do our study, and we come out, and we say, you know, there's 10 gigabits that's required. That's pretty much the steady state. And we say, great. Well, we don't go get a 10 gig pipe. We go get a 40 gig pipe. The reason we get a 40 gig pipe is that if you hook an oscilloscope up to a route path, you'd see every so often these microbursts of packets going in. You know, someone decides, two people decide at the same time to download a YouTube video. It kind of hoses your, your, your capacity. And, and, and like electricity or water, these packets, 300 million a second, you get nothing to do with them. You actually have to process them, so you, you, you get extra headroom. So now we've got 40 gigs of connectivity for 10 gig of steady state. And then you and I both know that if somebody, if that network, go, that link goes down, we're going to be in trouble. So we go get another link. We've got 80 gigs of connectivity for a 10 gig steady state. That's just crazy. And so therein lies a lot of the overcost as well. So we believe that this has to be one-tenth the cost. Our mission is to deliver this technology that will change the way people run their networks and deliver their services and applications, transform their business, and do it at a cost that's less than what they pay for the service on their existing routed infrastructure. That is disruption number two. Disruption number three is how it's consumed. For the last 25 years, I, I've always been on the vendor side. I, I, you know, it's funny. I, I wish someday to be a buyer of something. I'm always a seller. Um, but, you know, so, so you learn at a certain point, you know, you, you get kicked enough. And so what, what, what I've heard time and time again is, why is it you're charging me so much money when I'm trying to build the business and create value for myself and I'm unsure if I can do it? If I can do it, I'm happy to share with you. If I can't do it, I just don't want to have to pay you a ton of money because you're winning and I'm at my expense. So the way we want to make this technology available is a consumption model. This really makes a difference. We want to take routing as a technology and we are virtualizing it so that it exists as a potential on every single compute blade in your network. And then you can decide what services and applications you want to route. And we take a network-wide snapshot and we take it at five, with five-minute averages. So we eliminate all of your spikes. We don't care about spikes. Backup, you're not using backup. It's just potential. You're not using it. You don't pay for it. So, we, so consumption aligns your success and your value creation with the way we get paid. Session orientation, 
very low cost, and consumption model are three real game changers that taken together are very compelling. Can you give me one or two use cases for uh, different customers using your technology? Sure. So, so uh, it's funny because people want to know, you know, I, my, my board says the same thing. Like, tell me what your use cases are because everyone wants to break it down into use cases. Well, if my partner Patrick were here, he would say, well, the use case is everything. The, the flip side is everything you need to do with us, you already do. We just allow you to do it a lot cheaper, a lot faster, and a lot better. And so let, let's talk about some of those. Um, we deal with companies that have hundreds, if not thousands, of locations. They all have network connectivity. And it's called a wide area network. And they spend a lot of money on that network connectivity. And it's really complicated. And it has a lot of security challenges. So I, I'll give you a, a brief example. Let's imagine that we have two locations here and one out the window over there. They're both behind firewalls. We own them both. But I want to be able to route from a private address space here behind a firewall to the private address space there behind that firewall. They're not routable addresses, so I actually can't do it. I have to spend a lot of money on a special engineered pipe, in this case called an MPLS pipe, billions of dollars a year. It's crazy. If you put a session-oriented router that was session stateful on the edge of one network and a session-oriented router that was session stateful on the edge of the other network, they'd be completely routable. You would actually make the, the WAN disappear. It would take this private address space and that private address space and logically interconnect them. And you would have routing policies and service connectivity as if there was no WAN in between, with no cost for any special engineered pipe. Now, you might sit there and say, okay, well, so maybe I'm saving $10,000 a month connecting those two locations, but what if I have 5,000 locations? It's really different. It's really transformational. We want to make the WAN go away. So that's one use case. Another use case is data center interconnectivity. So a lot of people connect between their different data centers, and there's a lot of requirements to do encryption, you know, HIPAA and all this other stuff, the financial institutions. Well, because the network isn't session stateful, it doesn't know which stuff's encrypted and which stuff isn't encrypted. And what I really have is I've got a pipe, a big pipe full of traffic. And I don't really understand which packets are from which applications in a way that's meaningful such that I can figure out what's encrypted and what's not. So my problem is I either let partial, some things encrypted and some things not encrypted transit between data centers, and that may or may not be within the uh, you know, uh, acceptable uh, requirements for, for whatever regulatory agency I'm living up to, or I have to find a way to selectively encrypt what's on that flow. Unless you're session stateful, you're not going to be able to do any selective encryption. If you just encrypt the whole flow, you're going to be double encrypting some stuff, causing nasty packet fragmentation that nobody wants. So data center interconnect would be another. Another would be software-defined data center. Right now, routing stops at the front door of a data center, and everything is layer two after that. And it's really complicated. And we actually can extend routing all the way to the virtual machine. It's a more complicated conversation, but the point is that um, we can transform the way data centers are built out, and, and that's something that we're beginning to have conversations with people. That's really the third phase of what it is that we're working with. Um, another use case that, that you'll hear about um, from some of our customers is the notion of um, their cloud service providers, and the problem is they can only guarantee the SLA from the edge of their cloud. And the customer doesn't care about the SLA at the edge of their cloud. The customer cares about the SLA on their own prem. That's all I care about. If the service isn't working, I don't care if it's not working in your cloud or it's not working in the network in between. It's just not working. What I want is I want you to move that SLA, that guarantee of service and quality, from the edge of your data center to my desk and guarantee me that I'm going to get that SLA. That we, we enable that, too. So th these are examples. How do you successfully compete in an industry that is the IT industry, which is having a massive consolidation? Well, I mean, there, I, I've heard someone say there's an $11 trillion jump ball for enterprise IT. Um, I think everything's up for grabs and, and the world is changing. Fundamentally, um, our market is growing. You know, I think by 2020, 2021, um, the amount of routed traffic globally will be up uh, three, four, five hundred percent. Um, so that I really like. Um, I, I, don't, I think it's such a large addressable market. It is such a pressing need that uh, for us, I, I hope it's a question of just keeping up with the velocity over time. What were some of the key learnings that you were able to take from Acme Packet and apply here to 128 technology? Oh, my gosh. That, um, 
So much of who and what I am came from the last 25 years of my business experience. So, um, you know, what, what are they? First of all, I believe that almost all real disruption and real innovation happens from outside an industry. We're not from the routing industry, and we're disrupting routing. That's really important because think to some other models. You go back 10 years, a company, a computer company, said, I'm going to disrupt a 100-year-old industry called telephony, and I'm going to make a phone with one button. And everyone thought they were so crazy, and they changed. The iPhone changed. They invented the smartphone. Now we roll forward another three or four years from there. Some guy said, I, don't, I want a carbon-free world to get people around, and I'm not going to do it by taking a gas car and just replacing the gas engine. I'm going to build a totally different vehicle, and Elon Musk built Tesla. Real fundamental changes happen from outside an industry because they don't believe anything that was said to them. They question everything, and they look for the right solutions, and they're willing to take risks. And so I think one of the things that I learned at Acme Packet is that be bold, be willing to take risks, and be willing to do new and different things. Second thing is obviously an addressable market really matters. This is a much, much larger addressable market. Um, third thing is this is my fourth uh, startup, the third that I was, you know, one of the co-founders in. Um, you, you don't want to recreate the same business. You don't want the same culture. You don't want the same people. You want to work with great people, but not. you don't want everything to be the same. You, you want a blank slate and you want to move forward. And, you know, the, the people that you've known, you, th those are real tremendous assets. And if it makes sense, if, if, if they wanted to work with you and, and it makes, you know, real good sense for you to work with them, you should. But, but don't be reflexive in saying, I want to just take what I did there and just rebuild it here. I mean, really wipe the slate clean and start over again. And um, also recognize you're in a different position on the board. I'm, I'm 15 years older. The people I worked with are 15 years older and 15 years further in their career. They should be doing things that are 15 years more advanced than what they were doing when I initially worked with them. And so that, that inherently means that there's going to be new and different people in those slots. So don't be afraid of reinvention. Do new things and do not allow the past to be an anchor. What's most important to you when building out a team and how do you identify that? Well, I, I happen to be a fan of collaboration and team. I, I will say, just because it's important to get out right up front, I don't believe that uh, businesses are democracies. I think it's democracies are really wonderful. They're, in, they're, they're fundamentally kind of messy. Um, you know, business can, can, can actually be elegant. It, there can be leadership. When you look at great businesses, you often see that there is leadership and vision from the top in a way that's stunning. And the technologies today, particularly video conferencing and email and others, actually allow for greater span of control. So you've got Apple. That was really Steve Jobs came in and redefined that company. And Tim Cook runs that business. I mean, then you look at Oracle. It, it's Larry's business. It's really unbelievable. And Amazon is Jeff's business. So you, 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 things are different today than they were when we started that business. And so I, I believe that a leadership team is a group of folks that can share the vision, that are willing to support each other. Um, I like people that are at different are at different stages in their career. I think that's really interesting. It's nice to have some people that can see around the corner because they've been here before. And it's also nice to have people that are first time investing very heavily because they've never done it before. I happen to be a sucker for three things, attitude, aptitude, and I want people that are happy. I, I mean, I, I just can't work with people that aren't happy. It, it, life is too short. Um, and the older I get, the less I'm willing to suffer that. What does the future of 128 technology look like? Well, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I don't think I could tell you what the weather's going to be tomorrow. So, so no, knowing that's the ground rules, um, I do think in 60 months the, ma the majority of the large corporations in this world are going to have already begun the journey of putting software-based session-oriented routing technology at the edges of their networks to transform their ability to deliver services and applications safely, securely, and with agility to their internal and external customers. I think the network is going to change, and I think it's going to be better. I have a couple of questions just related to the internet in general. Sure. So the first one is, how do you see the future of the internet continuing to evolve? Yeah, clearly, the internet of things, the, the, the number of devices, the number of points that you can address and that have access to the internet is just going to continue to explode. Uh, it's, you know, we're mobile everywhere. 
you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not as deeply uh, steeped in the task of bringing high quality bandwidth to everyone in the world. I think that's really important. I think that is a basic human right. Um, but I, I'm not as focused on that, so I'm, I probably can't comment in any cogent way on that. Um, I, I definitely think that uh, the amount of bandwidth is going to increase dramatically. It's not just video. It's not just higher uh, bandwidth for transmission. I mean, think how long it took to go to high def and now to 4K. I mean, it, it's just happening so quickly. Um, I think virtual reality is going to be really powerful. I think that is going to change the way, uh, particularly digital natives. I mean, you and I are not, but the kids that are growing up now that have always had technology, they're going to drive a more immersive experience that I think will be richer, uh, but it will consume a terrific amount of bandwidth. And I'm interested to hear on what your thoughts are on net neutrality. Yeah, that one's above my pay grade. You know, that that's a tough one. Um, as a leader of 128 technology, I don't have an opinion. It, it doesn't matter to me. As a citizen of this country, I think two things are really important. I think, number one, I should have unfettered access. I really should be able to go where I want, when I want on the network, because I, I do believe that's a basic right. I, I also feel, this is a corollary, that people should be rewarded for taking risks and making investments in quality of experience that I'm going to want when I'm using the network. And if we don't allow people to recoup their investments, they're not going to make the investments, and then it's just going to fall to the government. So um, I do, I do um, hear some people who say to me, ultimately, the government's just going to have to take this over. I would like to think that you can have both net neutrality and allow people to have differentiated quality of experience uh, that they can monetize. I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I hope it does. I want to go into rapid fire questions now. Sure, so sure. First one is, what's another startup in the Boston area that you're most excited about? Gosh, I, I, I really only, I only have love for 128 technology. <laughs> I, I happen to really love Fuse. It's uh, unified communications, so uh, complex enterprise communications uh, is moving out to the cloud, and they can uh, take business processes like Salesforce.com and other things and tie them into your uh, your phone, your email. It's it's a neat business, it's, and it's growing like crazy, and it's based in Boston, so it hires a lot of people in the Commonwealth. What's something about you that most people don't know? I did go to college and made films. That's oh, what I did. Okay. <laughs> so that was really fun. I may, I, and I'd like to do that someday, um, to return back to producing, you know, really directing and producing some films would be really enjoyable. Are there any advances in technology that worry you? Oh, my God. Yeah. I, 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 first of all, I'm worried about technology advances in general. For really the first time in human history, we have seen the pace of change happen so dramatically that we no longer can keep up with it. And what that has created is that a sense of being unmoored. And, and, and it's changed everything. We no longer know where to get our news from. We no longer know how to separate our personal from our professional lives. We no longer know what is privacy that we value and what is convenience that we'll trade off for with, hello, Alexa, yes. I, do I really want someone from corporate America listening to every one of my communications in my home just so it's easier for me to order things on Amazon Prime? And I do love Amazon Prime. I don't know. These things so, – so technology has moved so fast, and its pace is quickening. And I think that that has huge implications for society. Um, and I don't know how to process it, but I see, I see manifestations of it everywhere from our political system – um, our social environment, uh, the anxiety we all have, it's, it's, it's not, and it's not going to abate. It's just going to get worse. What advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? I'm trying to imagine what it's like to be 20, first of all. <laughs> there was that pregnant pause. All the advice is, is revisionist, you know, have a little bit more balance, um, take a little bit more time to, to, to just do things that aren't necessarily along the path that you're trying so hard to run down. I'm not sure I would have lived it at all differently. Outside of 128, what do you look forward to the most? Oh, my gosh. I, so I love skiing. I uh, absolutely love it. And I love throwing the football with my kids and skiing with my kids. I really uh, enjoy poker. And I recently took up with a bunch of folks playing music in someone's basement, which at 50 years old, it's funny because now the kids are upstairs and we're downstairs. <laughs> It's, yeah, and we're drinking beers, and we don't know what they're doing upstairs, but that's okay. <laughs> Where do you like to go skiing? 
Uh, I well, I happen. I'm not a skiing snob. I think if there's snow, I want to ski. I love skiing up in Vermont. I love when there's a little bit of powder. I even love when it's all ice. It's just skiing. My favorite mountains out west, Alta, is a, just a phenomenal mountain. I love Utah. I've been doing yeah. some skiing out Crested Butte this year as well. And it's it's a skier's mountain. It's a skier's town. I just got back from Steamboat a few weeks ago. Oh, that's a neat yeah. town. Yeah, that was I, awesome. I was yeah, there for a week. I haven't been to Steamboat in 30 years, but I went with my <laughs> college roommate. And I loved it. What are some of your favorite tools to help make your life and work easier? Well, I would say I'm, I use my iPhone and my laptop, and those are pretty much my tools. It's, I, don't, I don't have much else. I mean, all the tools then are virtual. They're just the various applications. Mm-hmm. What are some of your favorite blogs or books? I love Michael Lewis books. I really do. I also um, have really enjoyed I, re- I recently read, even though I know it's late, Stephen King's book on the alternative history of uh, JFK. I find alternative history is interesting, too, because, you know, we often are very forensic in looking at why markets are the way they are and how they're going to change and where the leverage points are to change them and does that make a business opportunity for us or not. And so it's kind of neat to go see someone actually write an alternative history with only one data point changing and then rolling it forward. That was kind of fun. What are some of your favorite Michael Lewis books? I love The Big Short. Um, that, that one probably was one of my favorite. He just wrote a new one that I haven't read. My father showed me. I, I want to read it. Liar's Poker. You know, these are, these are the ones. They're, they're all excellent. Yeah. Just a few final questions to close out. Yeah. So where can people find out more about 128 Technology? So it's the website, www, which everybody knows, um, 128technology.com. And where can people connect with you online? I suppose... That's the best place to reach me. I don't do Facebook. Probably will start to do some social media, but to when I was the CEO of a public company, I, I really tried very hard to stay off social media. Could only get you in trouble. Mm-hmm. And lastly, do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for the audience? Well, it depends on who's listening. If you're if you're running complex networks, you definitely want smart se- session stateful routing. I, you know, I, I think that if you're listening to this because of uh, entrepreneurial activities. You know, find something you really enjoy doing with a really good group of folks and and throw yourself at it. And don't be afraid to be bold. I really believe that that's how change happens. Andy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure. Nick, thank you so much. If you liked today's episode... Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You'll get all my new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And if you really liked today's episode, it would mean a lot to me if you could write a review of the podcast as well. Just go to startupbostonpodcast.com slash iTunes. And remember, you can find all show notes with links at startupbostonpodcast.com. Until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com. Or reach out on Twitter at Startup Bosscast. That's Startup B-O-S-Cast. Cheers. Startup Bosscast.